So today, tonight, we are going to be talking about the thyroid gland and um, problems with it. And so I hope to give you a nice overview of the thyroid gland and the things that can go wrong with it and what it uh, does for you and why it's so important. And then things that you can do to help your thyroid gland to function better and um, things you can do on your own and then how to know when you need some help from a professional with your thyroid gland. My name, as Rebecca said, is Dr. Christine Thompson. I am a chiropractor and I also practice functional medicine and I've been here in downtown Fredericksburg since 1996. And um, the thyroid gland over time has become uh, increasingly more of a problem for people. And there's a lot of reasons for that that we will go over tonight so you understand it a little bit better. Um, these are statistics from the American Thyroid Association and um, the statistics are a few years old, but they were the most recent statistics that I could get. Um, but it's estimated that 20 million Americans have some sort of uh, thyroid disease, something going wrong with their thyroid, not working right. So there are a lot of people suffering with thyroid problems, and it is notoriously difficult to diagnose. Uh, women are much more likely to have thyroid issues than men, and that has to do with uh, women's bodies and women's hormones and how women are affected by the different chemicals that are out there. So um, I wanted to just give you a little overview of the hormonal system or the endocrine system as we know it, because the thyroid gland is a central keystone gland in the endocrine system. The endocrine system is our hormonal system. So all the glands in the endocrine system produce hormones, and hormones are these extremely powerful chemical messengers that our body makes to send signals to the cells and communicate with our cells so that our cells know what to do. And um, uh, hormones are made in a tiny, tiny amounts, uh, sometimes nanograms and picograms, which are billions and trillions of a gram. So very tiny amounts, but they're very powerful. And most of the hormones that are produced uh, are involved in something that we call a feedback system, meaning that once you've produced enough of a hormone, it sends a signal up to the brain and tells the brain that that's enough for a little while. And so the brain um, stops producing the hormones that signal the production of these hormones, and, um, and so the system is shut down. So um, it's a very delicate system, delicately balanced, and when there are hormones from the outside that are getting introduced into the system, it, it throws a wrench into this whole feedback mechanism and letting the glands know when it's time to make hormones. All right, so um, the thyroid gland is sitting there, there at the base of your neck at your throat. And um, sometimes when people start having a problem with their thyroid gland, they can, and they can feel uh, something going on there. They can feel a tightness, they can feel a growth, they can feel difficulty swallowing, things like that. And sometimes not, sometimes people aren't aware of it. But the thyroid gland regulates so much of what goes, in our, goes on in our bodies through the thyroid hormones. It regulates our, our basic uh, metabolism, the rate that our metabolism runs at. But it also has a lot to do with how your intestinal system and digestive system absorbs nutrients, how it's able to move uh, things through the digestive system, um, how it's able to uh, metabolize fats and proteins, um, and then uh, it also regulates a, a lot of what our heart does, regulates the, the um, strength and the rate of the heartbeat, and it regulates a lot of our other hormones in our body. So um, lots of things going on with the thyroid gland, and, and it's extremely important. We can't live without our thyroid hormones. We have to have them, and our cells depend on those thyroid hormones to signal them and, and tell them what to do. So um, the main hormones um, that are produced by the thyroid gland are called T4 and T3 for short. And um, mostly our thyroid gland produces T4, and then that T4 is, is converted to T3. It does produce a little bit of T3, but mostly 
the T4 is converted to T3 in the liver and in the intestinal tract and in several other organs of the body. So um, you probably uh, get an idea from that that you also have to have a healthy liver and a healthy intestinal tract in order to be able to um, make the thyroid hormones and convert them because T3 is what the cells of our body expect to get. T3 is what goes into the receptors of, the, of every cell of our body. And, and that's what signals our cells what to do as far as metabolism and digestion and, and absorption. The thyroid gland is signaled by the pituitary to make thyroid hormones, and the pituitary gland is signaled by the hypothalamus. And both of those uh, are parts of our brain. Um, and so the brain is what actually really regulates the thyroid gland. Okay, so the two types of things that can go on with thyroid is it can be under-functioning or it can be over-functioning. And when it is under-functioning, we call that hypothyroid. And these are this list here that you see on the screen is the list of symptoms that you might um, feel if your thyroid is under-functioning or hypothyroid. And so, as you can see, it's symptoms that your body is just under-functioning, the metabolism is low, your body isn't producing enough thyroid hormone, and you are under-functioning. So you, you get all kinds of things like constipation, things aren't moving through, you have dry skin, you have fatigue, you have dry hair, you have all the things that are signals of your body under-functioning. And then if you have a hyperthyroid, your thyroid is over-functioning, uh, producing too much thyroid hormone, and then you get the problems with um, the body over-functioning and functioning at a, at a higher rate. So you end, can end up with hair loss, you can end up with a rapid heartbeat and sweating and heat intolerance and irritability and uh, muscle problems um, and, and gas and, and things that show that your body is functioning at too high a rate. Okay, so I'm pushing the wrong button there. Oh, sometimes I have trouble getting this, this, these slides to advance, so let me try it this way. Here we go. Oops, went too far. Okay. All right, there we go. Sorry about that. Sometimes the buttons on my computer don't work right. All right, so the most common thyroid condition today in our country is called um, hypothyroidism, and it's a particular type of hypothyroidism called Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And it is actually an autoimmune condition, and it's a situation where your immune system is actually attacking the thyroid gland and causing it to underfunction. And so you get all those signs that we just read that are have to do with the body under functioning and the thyroid gland under functioning and not having enough thyroid hormone. Um, so because this is actually not a, a true thyroid disease, it's actually an immune system problem because the immune system is attacking the thyroid gland and we, we treat it like we do other autoimmune conditions. So it's a similar type of treatment to other autoimmune conditions. And that's important to note. So if you have Hashimoto's thyroiditis and know that you have um, thyroid antibodies, so you've been diagnosed with an autoimmune condition, you need to be sure and treat it as an autoimmune condition. Um, you may still need to take thyroid hormones because, like I said, in order to function and be healthy, we have to have enough thyroid hormones in our body. But you also have to address the autoimmune Part of that because that's really what's going on in the body. So the estimates are somewhere around uh, 80 to 90 percent of hypothyroid in our country is actually Hashimoto's thyroiditis or an autoimmune condition, which kind of makes sense because autoimmune conditions are skyrocketing in our country and around the world. They are really um, uh, increasing by leaps and bounds and are a real problem today. So um, here's just a, a slide that just shows you some of the other autoimmune conditions that are um, pretty rampant today, uh, lots of different parts of the body being affected besides the thyroid gland. 
So let's talk a little bit about the connection between the gut and the brain and the thyroid gland. You know, as you saw, the thyroid gland is dependent on uh, the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland to signal it to in order to produce thyroid hormones. So if the brain isn't functioning optimally and isn't signaling the way it needs to, then uh, we can end up having problems with the thyroid gland. And um, what can cause the brain to behave that way? Well, it's usually inflammation in the brain. So too much inflammation, too much cortisol, these things can interfere with the production of the hormones that the brain makes in order to signal the thyroid gland. And then we also have a connection with the in intestinal tract uh, because all autoimmune conditions are associated with some sort of an, uh, a gut problem. So let's talk just a minute about leaky gut because um, this is the beginning of autoimmune conditions. Uh, start with a leaky gut. And all it means is that we have uh, an increased amount of intestinal permeability. So the, this drawing that you see, and hopefully you can see my little mouse here, but this is uh, a, a layer of cells that line your intestinal tract. And this layer of cells is designed to sweep things through that we don't want getting into our bloodstream. And it's designed to sweep them right out of our body. Um, but when this, the cells have become unhealthy and the space between the cells have been damaged and widened, things can fit through there. Um, bugs and protein particles and all kinds of things can come right through those cells and get into our bloodstream. And then that sets us up for autoimmune conditions. Once we have foreign particles in our bloodstream, the immune system gets upset about that and starts attacking the, um, the foreign particles. And if those foreign particles look some, in some way similar to the proteins in our own body, then the immune system them can get overactivated and can start to attack some of the tissues of our own body. And that really is how autoimmune conditions work in, in a nutshell, <laughs> quickly explained. So, um, so basically what we have uh, is a lot of inflammation going on in the body. So I just wanted to show you this slide because I wanted to make sure that everybody understands inflammation. It's a word that's thrown around a lot. And inflammation is a natural process. It's something necessary for healing. We, we don't heal properly without inflammation. But it also can become a problem. And when, it, when it's a problem, we call it chronic inflammation, which means that it, it keeps coming back or doesn't go away. And it stays chronically in our body. So when we injure ourselves, Inflammation is the redness and swelling that you see that um, tells the, the body's immune system to come over and to take care of this injury and to help the body to heal. So um, it's part of the whole process, and it's a necessary part. So what happens when that process gets blocked, and it can get blocked by taking um, pharmaceutical anti-inflammatory medications we know will block the process of inflammation, and that can set us up for chronic inflammation. And this is um, new information that we've discovered about uh, pharmaceutical anti-inflammatories, that they actually do block the resolution of inflammation and set us up for chronic inflammation. So I, I thought that was an important um, new bit of information that I would like you all to have. All right, so let's now talk about something that is called hormone disruptors or endocrine, endocrine disruptors. There's various names for them, but they are basically chemicals that are um, produced by industry and are released into our environment, and they act as if they are our own hormones or they can mimic our hormones, they can accentuate our hormones, they can block our hormones, they can do a lot of things with our own body hormones, um, but basically they cause our, our hormones not to work properly and they give 
um, misinformation to ourselves and, and tell ourselves to, uh, to do things or not do things that are harmful to our body. And uh, so I'm going to go through some lists of what these hormone disruptors can be. Um, there's tons and tons of them out there, and we're all exposed to them. So what we need to do is be aware of them and do our best to limit them and limit our exposure to them. So um, first of all, let's just talk about the chemicals that are um, added to our foods and products. So we know that there is a, a minimum of 84,000 different chemicals that are allowed and legal in our country that are added to our food and products. And the thing that you need to know about these chemicals is there is no requirement that they be proved to be safe. Um, and, and it is uh, up to the, these companies that make them or watchdog organizations to prove that they are, they are either safe or unsafe. And my very favorite watchdog organization is a, a group that's called the Environmental Working Group. And you can find them online at ewg.org. And they do a lot of testing of these various chemicals that are out there in our products and in our food to see if they really are safe. And a good many of these 84,000 chemicals are being found to be hormone disruptors. We don't really know the exact amount of hormone disruptors that are out there, but we know a lot of these chemicals that are legal are, are actually very harmful to us. And um, the thing that is a little bit frightening to me is a study that the Environmental Working Group did where they looked at umbilical cords and they found 287 different chemicals in the umbilical cord. And um, of those, they know that 180 of these chemicals cause cancer in humans, are proven to cause cancer. And the 217 of them are, are neurotoxins. Uh, in other words, they interfere with the development of the brain and nervous system. So we have um, some real dangerous things going on, and we just need to be more aware of that. So I'm going to go through some of these toxic chemicals because I think it's, um, it's not helpful to be just paranoid and afraid, but it is very helpful to be informed and aware and to know that there are things that we can start to avoid. So pesticides and herbicides are, um, are known to be hormone disruptors and are known to be harmful to the thyroid gland. So all those chemicals that I'm going to go through now are, are known to be harmful to the thyroid gland. Um, and then there are flame retardants, which are found in a lot of the furniture that you buy. Um, a lot of the um, electronics that you buy have flame retardants on them. And you can um, off-gas some of these. So with the flame retardants, you want to let computers and furniture and things like that sit outside, and you want the, to allow those chemicals to off-gas into the environment and not into your home um, because they are so toxic. And then we have a chemical that's called dioxin um, that is found in a lot of plastic production and pesticides and different manufacturing processes. And then uh, we have another product that is found in uh, liquid hand soaps, um, antibacterial liquid hand soaps. And then we have something called um, PFOA, which is used in nonstick cookware and stain resistant fabrics. And all of these chemicals are, have been found to be very harmful for the thyroid gland. Now let's talk a little bit about plastics. Um, to me, I think plastics are one of the most dangerous uh, chemicals that are out there and one of, the most, uh, one of the ones that we can start to avoid and reduce in our life. We can't avoid it completely, certainly, because we're surrounded by plastics, but um, we can certainly reduce the amount of plastics that we use and most definitely in the plastic um, uh, drinks that are found in the water and, and sodas and anything else that's found in a plastic water bottle, you can start buying um, these things in glass. And you can start using glass uh, in your house and, and when you travel. And the other thing is the uh, uh, phthalates. 
And these are used in um, plastics and vinyl flooring and, and uh, different adhesives. And they also are found to disrupt thyroid function. A lot of these uh, different chemicals I'm going through have been found to either block the thyroid hormones or somehow alter the formation of the thyroid hormones um, and the way that they move through the body. And then we go to the heavy metals. So the thyroid, unfortunately, is very vulnerable to some of the heavy metals that are out there. And uh, cadmium is one of them. And um, it's found in various uh, fertilizers, it's found in plastics, and found, it's found in um, a mining and uh, mining industry. You see a lot of cadmium, and it can be very harmful to the thyroid gland. And then we have lead, which is also a neurotoxin and dangerous for the thyroid gland. And that is found in mining, and also um, it's still actually in the environment from leaded gasoline, even though leaded gas has been off the market for a long time, we still have tons of lead in the air because of that. Uh, and then we also have mercury, which we can get from um, having dental work done, and we get it from coal burning power plants. And it, it definitely inhibits um, thyroid hormone production and, um, and it can reduce our body's ability to take in iodine. Aluminum is another heavy metal that's dangerous for the thyroid that's found in um, various over-the-counter medications. Um, it's found in vaccines. It's found in aluminum cookware or any, anything that you eat out of aluminum. And um, it, it definitely affects the iodine uptake and thyroid hormone production. So you want to avoid aluminum. And then we move on to something called the halogens. And the halogens are a particular type of uh, natural chemical that is out there, and, but is also added to various products. So um, iodine is a halogen, and iodine is necessary in order to make thyroid hormones. Thyroid hormones are, are made from iodine. And the problem with the other halogens is that they can uh, bump that iodine out and take the place of the iodine so that our thyroid gland can't produce the thyroid hormones that it needs. And some of these halogens that can do that are bromine, which is found in flour and other packaged foods and sodas, and uh, fluoride, which is found in very dental products, uh, toothpaste and things like that, and also in, in fluoridated water, if your water has been fluoridated. And then we have chlorine that is put in our water as a disinfectant, and it's put in pools as a disinfectant. And so we have a, a pretty heavy exposure to chlorine also, and all of those can bump out iodine so that you, your thyroid gland can't make thyroid hormone. All right, so let's move on to another popular topic, which is stress. And um, stress can have a detrimental effect on the thyroid gland when it's not managed properly. So the stress response is part of your body's uh, emergency response to danger. And so anytime you have thoughts of danger, the, the stress response is uh, activated. And what your body does is to produce some hormones called adrenaline and cortisol. And cortisol, unfortunately, interferes with the conversion of uh, thyroid hormones. It interferes with the conversion of T4 to T3. And remember, T3 is what our cells need in order to get the signaling that they need from the thyroid gland. They need T3. And it also interferes with the production of thyroid stimulating hormone or TSH, which is what the pituitary makes to send to the thyroid gland to signal it. So we can have a lot of interference when we have a stress response that's out of control and being activated a lot so that we are producing a lot of cortisol. All right, so what do we do about all these problems? We're exposed to all these nasty chemicals where um, we have stress in our lives and uh, where our thyroid gland um, is not functioning very well in a, a lot of people. A lot of people are having this problem. 
And um, so what can you do? Well, there are lifestyle factors that you can change. And I think you've probably gathered some of that just from the things that I've mentioned. You've probably already thought of ways that you can start to reduce your exposure to some of these chemicals and reduce your stress response. Um, and uh, we can start to put, put, uh, purchase uh, products that are cleaner, that are safer, that don't have these chemicals in them. Um, we can get rid of processed foods in our diet and because a lot of the uh, chemicals are found in processed foods, and most of them are, and start to eat organic and to avoid the pesticides and herbicides. So what is good nutrition for the thyroid gland? Basically, you want to eat things that have been produced without pesticides. You want to eat foods that have been grown in soil that is rich in all the nutrients that we need for our thyroid gland, and we'll go over those nutrients. We want to eat whole foods, and we want them to be organically grown so that there's minimal pesticides. We also want to avoid gluten, and there's an interesting story around gluten, and it relates directly to Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is the autoimmune condition, which, as you remember, is, uh, is about 90% of thyroid disease out there is Hashimoto's. And what we have discovered with gluten is that um, the gluten causes a leaky gut and causes um, it so that um, these molecules can pass straight through into the bloodstream and cause inflammation and cause an activation of the, of the um, immune system and, um, and cause the immune system to start to attack the thyroid gland. And we have found a particular problem with people who have been diagnosed with Hashimoto's. About, um, I'm going to say, I think it's about 60% of people with Hashimoto's end up being very gluten sensitive. So not everybody, but a good percentage of people with Hashimoto's are very gluten sensitive. And so um, because gluten is so inflammatory uh, to the d digestive tract, so difficult to digest and can cause leaky gut, it's just a good thing to avoid when you're um, suspecting that you have thyroid issues. But um, uh, Christine, but the at the bottom yep. of the slide though, just to point it out, um, those are all the things that you can eat, right? Um, so there's yes. lots of options for people who really um, shouldn't uh, be eating gluten or can, you know, really can't tolerate it. So there's lots of options. Absolutely. Now, remember, we don't have to have grains in our, our diet to be healthy. They're not an essential nutrient, but um, they, they are, some of them are very good and nutritious and have a lot of vitamins and minerals in them and are very tasty. So these are some of the grains that don't have gluten in them that you, if you are gluten sensitive, that you can add to your diet. Amaranth, millet, buckwheat, quinoa, sorghum, rice, and oats. And the oats, you have to make sure that they say gluten-free on them because sometimes gluten has been added to oats that they are uh, not, they don't naturally have gluten. Thanks for pointing that out, Rebecca. <laughs> and here's a list of nutrients um, that we know that the thyroid needs in order to make thyroid hormone. So we know that we need iodine. In fact, T4 has four iodine molecules on it. That's why it's called um, T4. Um, and we get iodine usually from the sea. So we get it from wild caught fish. We get it from sea vegetables, but we can also get it from milk and eggs and some green vegetables. We can get um, a decent amount of iodine. Selenium is a mineral that is uh, found in the soil. Um, however, when soils have been depleted through improper farming methods, we end up with uh, very low selenium in foods. But some of the foods that are higher in selenium are Brazil nuts and sunflower seeds, and also some of the fishes like halibut and sardines. And then, of course, vitamin C, which is in almost all of your fruits and vegetables. So but especially high in red peppers, kiwi, broccoli, kale, strawberries, and tomatoes. And then we also need zinc very much. Zinc is an important mineral that also is found to be deficient in a lot of people because it has been depleted from the soil so much. 
and it's necessary for the immune system to function properly and it's necessary for the thyroid gland to function properly. And these are some of the foods where you can find zinc. You can find it in lamb, pumpkin seeds, grass-fed beef, chickpeas, and cocoa powder. Another very important mineral is magnesium. And a lot of people today are very deficient in magnesium, and that's because a lot of people are eating processed foods. And processed foods are very deficient in magnesium. But if you're eating a diet full of whole foods, full of organic foods, you are bound to get a good amount of magnesium. And, um, and so you can find that in spinach and kale and pumpkin seeds and almonds and lots of really yummy foods have magnesium in them. Vitamin A is necessary for the thyroid gland to function properly. And um, vitamin A is really important for gut health for the lining of our intestinal tract and for our immune system to function properly. And um, it is one of the fat soluble vitamins. And so it is in um, really high amounts in some of the um, meatier foods like um, beef liver, butter, egg yolks, things like that. But you can also find it in some of our vegetables that we love like sweet potato, kale, and broccoli. And then vitamin T D is another one of the fat soluble vitamins. And we get wonderful vitamin D from sunlight. And it's actually uh, really thought that vitamin D isn't so much a vitamin as it is a hormone now. And it's very, very important for the immune system has, and has been linked to uh, importance for preventing cancer, for preventing all kinds of illness. And we can um, get it from sunlight, but if we're not getting enough sunlight, which we definitely don't get enough of in Virginia in the wintertime, so you can get it from uh, natural cod liver oil uh, and other fish, and you can get it from eggs and some mushrooms too. And then the other vitamin that is really important for the thyroid gland is uh, B2, which is also known as riboflavin. And that also, a lot of B vitamins are found in um, animal products. Uh, they can be found in other places too, uh, especially riboflavin. But mostly uh, beef liver, yogurt, eggs, uh, things like that are going to be high in B2. You can also get it from uh, quinoa and almonds and spinach and things like that. All right. So let's talk for a minute about those, all those nasty toxins that we talked about that are, uh, we're exposed to. And some we don't have that much control over, some we do. But some we, we just don't. They're in the air. They are in coming from industrial manufacturing plants. They're in our water. They're in a lot of places. So we have to really uh, take care of our body's own ability to get rid of these toxins. And all of these body systems that I have listed here are part of our natural inborn detoxification system. We have a lymphatic system that moves, moves toxins through little tubules that then get dumped uh, uh, to go out of our body. And then we have our blood uh, tries to filter through some of those toxins also. Our skin is always filtering things out. Uh, whenever you get a rash on your skin, most of the time that is due to your, your skin trying to filter out toxins out of your body. And then we have our kidneys that filter all the fluids in our body. We have our colon that filters out all the solid materials. Um, and, and the colon is the part of our body that we're talking about gut health and our gut lining. And I showed you those cells that line our body and I talked about leaky gut. The colon is the part of the gut that we're talking about when we're talking about leaky gut. That's where the um, the cells uh, can become more permeable and we can have toxins leak through those cells into our bloodstream and become inflammatory, uh, toxic, dangerous chemicals in our bloodstream. And then our lungs are try trying to filter the air that come in. And our liver, oh, our wonderful liver is our main detox organ and it is uh, working all the time trying to filter out those toxins and convert them from 
fat soluble, which most toxins that enter our body are fat soluble, and our liver converts them to water soluble so they can be washed out through the colon. And so um, we want to take care of all those parts of our body since they're very, very important. So we want to have healthy habits to keep those body systems functioning and filtering out toxic chemicals. So um, the other thing that can help a lot is movement. Uh, movement actually activates the lymphatic system and keeps it working properly. Without movement, our lymphatic system doesn't move. And it also reduces the stress response. So it can reduce the amount of circulating cortisol just by uh, regular movement and exercise. And it can also raise our metabolism when we're having a problem with hypothyroid and uh, having a lowered metabolism. Um, and, and then- I was just gonna ask, Christine, how much exercise does somebody need to get? So if this isn't you know, a new idea um, for somebody who hasn't really been exercising regularly. So it, it depends on what your um, daily life is like. So what I tell people is if, if you sit at a desk for eight hours a day, there is no amount of exercise that you can do that will make up for that eight hours of sitting. So you have to move during the day. Um, it's definitely beneficial to have an exercise regimen daily. Um, and the amount of time that you exercise is going to be dependent on what else you're doing during your day. But the very most important thing that you can do all day long is just to get up and move around. So do not sit at that desk. Get up at least every 20 to 30 minutes. Do a couple of yoga poses. Do some stretches. Walk around your desk. Jump up and down a little bit. Whatever it is that you need to do, but move. Your body is made for movement and it's the more you move during the day the healthier it is for you um does that answer the question rebecca yes i'm about to get up and do jumping jacks right here and now so no <laughs> yeah exactly yes we have to move 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 as much as possible all day long now if, if you're trying to um uh start uh, some fat burning, get your body burning fat. There's specific types of exercise for that. If you're trying to raise your metabolism, you want to exercise about 30 minutes of, of cardio, like a high intensity uh, exercise to get that metabolism going. Um, for fat burning, it's more of the uh, high intensity intervals. So, and you don't have to do very much of it. It can be as little as 10 or 15 minutes a day, but um, high intensity. So it depends on uh, what it is that you're trying to do and what your body needs to, to determine what type of exercise regimen you should adopt. And um, so I, I usually tailor that to people depending on what it is that they're needing. Okay. Um, and just because I, I just saw it pop up, it's just switching gears a little bit, going back to leaky gut, there's a question um, that an, a participant has. Does leaky gut show up on a colonoscopy test? No, it does not. So um, leaky gut is increased permeability of the cells lining the, the colon. So we can see when those cells are damaged, but we can't see what the spaces between them look like on a colonoscopy. Uh, but there is a particular molecule that holds those cells together. And so we can actually do um, tests for that, that uh, molecule it's called zonulin. And it's the little fibers that hold the cells of the colon together. And so if zonulin is being destroyed, um, then we can uh, recognize that on a, on a specific test. We can also do uh, antibody tests and see if um, the immune system is attacking parts of the colon. Um, so there are ways that we can tell, um, but a colonoscopy usually doesn't reveal that, and it's not something that a gastrointestinal doctor is looking for. It's a, it's a fairly new concept. It is being accepted medically for a long time. It was um, not accepted in, in the medical field as a real thing, but now since we have discovered those, um, those 
little molecules that um, and how they work and how they keep the intestinal permeability at the right amount now is being accepted as a, a real problem and something that's diagnosable. So that probably didn't uh, give you a lot of information, but there are ways to diagnose it. Okay, great. Okay, so um, proper sleep is also important, and we know um, that sleep affects how your body produces hormones. And we also know that the brain's lymphatic system is activated during sleep. So in other words, your brain detoxes itself during sleep. So if you're suffering from brain inflammation, and if you have leaky gut, I guarantee that you also have leaky brain and have some brain inflammation because the two go together. And so um, it's very important that you get enough sleep so that your brain's lymphatic system can be activated and it can start detoxing itself. We find that most people need about seven to nine hours. That varies a lot um, and it's very individual. So you need as much sleep as you need. And if you're um, waking up feeling rested, you're probably getting enough sleep. If you're waking up still feeling tired, you're probably not getting enough sleep. But it's really important what kind of habits you adopt before you go to sleep. We know that the light from electronics signals the brain that it's time to wake up. So if you have watched um, TV, if you've looked at your computer, if you've looked at your phone, um, if you've done anything with electronics, within an hour of bedtime, your brain w is going to be uh, getting the signal to wake up. So you might fall asleep right away, but you'll probably wake up in a couple of hours and your brain thinks it's time to wake up. So your sleep will be disturbed. Um, so there's lots of things that you can do to try to tell your brain, nope, it's time for sleep and rest and uh, quiet time. And uh, keeping the lights dim is one of those things and um, doing some, some type of uh, habit that that relaxes you, listening to some soft music, doing some prayer meditation, doing some stretches, doing uh, some yoga poses, doing some um, breathing exercises, um, reading a little bit with, with not too bright a light. Those kind of things can help you to relax and sleep well. So that's a lot of information. And um, I'm hoping that, uh, that a lot of it was clear, but I also know that it was a lot to absorb and there's probably still a lot of questions. It gets complex, complicated when we're talking about complicated um, organs in the body like the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland is very complicated and the way it makes hormones and way, the way those hormones travel through the body and the way they're converted and the way they go to our cells, all of that is very complicated and reliant on a lot of different molecules and, and uh, nutrients in our body to work properly. So what I tell people is there is a lot that you can do on your own, as I just went through, but there's also a lot that you might need help with. And so that's where I come in. This is where my training is. Um, and what I provide is a uh, functional medicine analysis of what's going on. And all that means is in, in functional medicine, we find the root cause of your health issue. And then we determine uh, how to remove that root cause, how to balance the body, how to give your body what it needs so that you can heal and recover and rebalance in um, the parts of your body that have been damaged and um, be rejuvenated and you can heal. So it's really uh, using natural methods to address the root cause of your health issue is the way I would summarize functional medicine. And we have a lot of tools available to do that. So um, uh, the, the whole idea here is that with holistic healthcare and functional medicine, you're first going to find the problem, determine what, what exactly the problem is, what is the root cause of your problem, and we have, um, we can use traditional methods to do that. We can use blood tests. We can use uh, some hormone testing methods 
we can find out if you have any heavy metals in your body. Um, a lot of times, heavy metals end up being stored in body tissues. So uh, a lot of times, if you've been exposed to mercury or aluminum, you may not find it at all in your blood, you, but you may find it in some of the other body tissues. And because your body knows how neurotoxic those heavy metals are and how damaging they can be, and so they're stored away. And so in order to determine that level of toxicity, we, we do some other types of testing. And then what we do is to um, develop a program. So we, we develop a, an individualized program that is going to address the lifestyle issues that are at the root cause of your health issue and then help you to um, develop better habits and healthier habits and, and ways that you can heal and still have the quality of life that you want and the type of life that you want and the, and the lifestyle habits that are important to you. So we find a, a way to arrange your life that works for you and your schedule and yet helps you to be healthier and to heal and to recover from your health issues. Healing takes time. That's my mantra. And I have to say that all the time because what I do is not a quick fix. It's not a magic pill. It's not something that's going to happen overnight. A lot of times we have to look at how long has the problem been there? Uh, how long have you been dealing with this issue? And we have to be realistic about how long it's going to take to solve the problem and to correct the um, the, the lifestyle uh, factors that were at the, at the root cause of your health issue. So it will take time. It'll take time for your body to rebuild. But you will, along the way, you will see definite progress. You will see evidence that your body is healing, uh, even though the healing may take more time. So I want to just mention that when I do my functional medicine analysis, I do use some very traditional testing like blood tests, but I use a different um, uh, a way of looking at these tests and a, a, a different range of values. So we use what are called functional lab ranges. So most labs out there, especially with blood testing, use lab ranges that are designed to look at the whole population and to, they are also used to diagnose the disease. So I really don't aim at diagnosing a disease. I really want to diagnose what is, has gone wrong with your body and, and where the imbalances are in your body and what is causing the symptoms and health issues that you have. In order to do that, I have to narrow that range a little bit from the standard lab ranges. So we narrow it into what's called a functional lab range, which just means that we're looking at a healthier range. Instead of looking at where the whole entire population is, we look at, well, where are the healthy people? Where are their lab ranges? So even though the lab may say that your thyroid stimulating hormone, your TSH, which is produced by the pituitary gland, should be between 0.3 and 5.7, I'm going to say, well, no, I'd really rather it was between 1.8 and 3.0 um, because that is a healthier range for the, um, for the signaling of the thyroid gland and what we want to see happening in your body and for you to feel better. And then um, the other thing that I do is I order some specialized tests. So uh, the thyroid gland is notoriously difficult to diagnose on blood tests. And sometimes it's just simply because the right tests weren't ordered. So I don't only look at the um, standard values that um, most medical professionals will look at, which is TSH and T4 and sometimes T3. I look at some of these other values because they can tell me what's really going on with the thyroid and where the problem is. Um, we also are going to do um, other types of testing. We can do some hormone testing. We can look at heavy metals, as I said before. We can do a physical exam. We can do some autoimmune testers. We have a lot at our disposal to determine where the problem is, where the root cause is, and so that we can start 
the healing process. I also wanted to mention some of the products that I carry in my office that I found very beneficial for the thyroid gland. Um, one of my favorite things to use for the thyroid is herbals because um, a lot of these herbals are, are modulating herbals. So they will help the thyroid gland, uh, whether it's under-functioning or over-functioning, they, they help the thyroid gland to just function better. And they also help your body to, um, to resolve inflammation rather than blocking inflammation, we want to resolve the inflammation. So this thyroid complex from Mediherb is one of my favorites for the thyroid gland because it has a, a few different herbs in it that are known to be tonics for the thyroid gland and to, um, and to help the, the thyroid gland to just function more optimally. And then these are a few of the other products that I carry. Um, this one from Apex Energetics has a variety of different nutrients and enzymes and even some glandulars in it that help to rebuild the thyroid gland when it's been damaged. And then I have something from Standard Process called Itrofen PMG. And we um, learned just recently, I came back from a seminar uh, at the new research center that Standard Process has built in North Carolina. And we learned that these um, PMG products, which are actually protomorphogens, they are actually the part of the DNA that helps your body to resolve inflammation. So instead of blocking inflammation and being anti-inflammatory, we're actually going to help the body move into the resolution phase by using these PMG products. And this one in particular is made from the thyroid gland. And it's actually made of the microRNA, which is the, um, the matter that they've just revealed uh, in our DNA that is so essential that they didn't know what it was for so many years. And then we have a special iodine product. We have to be a little bit careful with iodine with thyroid issues. Some people are very sensitive to iodine. Some people are allergic. Some people don't respond well to iodine. But if you are deficient in iodine, you can't make enough thyroid hormone. And so it is important to um, supplement iodine. And this particular iodine product I've found to be very good and safe for that because it is a, a protein-bound iodine made from food. And the body absorbs it very well. And it, and it does not have the negative effects that some other iodine products can have for people. And then... Um, Lastly, but certainly not least, uh, we need our omega-3 oils um, because um, the omega-3s are so highly anti-inflammatory, and, and, but they actually what they do is help you resolve inflammation. Um, so they do um, help you to not go into that chronic inflammatory phase. And the other thing we found out in our seminar uh, that we went to recently is that when we pair this tuna omega oil with the phytrophin PMG, um, we get better resolution of inflammation. Um, and, and so it's kind of the little missing component that um, scientists have recently discovered is that we need that micro RNA in order to completely resolve inflammation. Okay. So I just wanted to show you a couple of uh, slides on the real life, real people who I have helped to get over thyroid conditions. And um, this was a lovely lady that I worked with it, that um, she um, was, had never been diagnosed as having Hashimoto's. And she actually ha had Hashimoto's. And when we were able to um, to know the root cause of her problem and help her to resolve that, she, her weight just started melting off. And really the only reason she came to me was she weren't, wasn't able to lose weight no matter what she tried. And so it was really a, like a miracle to her. She was very happy. And then this lovely young woman um, also came to me with hypothyroidism. And, um, and we've uh, addressed that and some other health issues that she has been uh, dealing with for quite some time. 
and she's gotten some great results and been able to lose weight and um, seeing her blood markers improve dramatically and decrease the inflammation in her body. So thyroid issues are very treatable. If you've been frustrated with yours and, and have been unable to get a proper diagnosis or have, have been unable to resolve some of the symptoms associated with your thyroid issue despite taking thyroid hormones, there's a, there's a lot of other things that we can do to help you besides uh, just giving you thyroid hormones. And, and, and just to so, note, guys, the, the actual video testimonials from those patients, as well as a lot of other patients, are available through the um, Whole Health Solutions website. So you can look for uh, the drop-down success stories, and you can see a lot of those videos. And they're very short, but very, uh, very effective. Yeah, they're just a few minutes long, but they give more details them, themselves right out of their own mouth about their experience and, and how they were helped. So um, I think that is uh, the gist of the information that I had for you. Um, I do want to tell you that I am running a couple of specials this month, the month of November. And um, one of those is that for a donation to uh, St. George's Episcopal Church has a program called The Table, where they take donations of fresh produce from local farms and then they distribute that, um, those vegetables free to the community, to whoever is in need of, of fresh food. They distribute that um, on, on a, once a week when, uh, when, of course, when the growing season is going, uh, which won't be now, but they do once a week during the growing season. And so for a donation to St. George's, I will give you a free introductory uh, consult where we sit down and we discuss what your issue is and whether you are a good fit for a functional medicine analysis. And um, we suggest that you donate $45, but you are welcome to donate whatever you would like to. And then the other special that I'm running is a 20% discount on the supplements that I just uh, mentioned to you that are very helpful for the thyroid gland. And um, I wanted to also tell you to be sure and go to my website and you can take a, um, a health assessment, uh, a little test there uh, right on my website. It'll uh, pop up and it's um, a free health assessment. And then we can discuss that, uh, your score on that health assessment if you would like once you've done that. You can subscribe to my newsletter on my website and you can see all of my webinars. Rebecca posts them uh, once they're ready. She posts them on the website, and so you can watch webinars on other topics uh, on my website. Um, and I think that was it, right? Anything else, Rebecca? Yeah, Erin, just to mention, um, even with the, that introductory visit, that first consult, you can do that over the phone as well with somebody who's all the way out in California, maybe, or even have like a Zoom call like this. Um, so you can still be face-to-face, -face, but um, not having to be in the same room. Yes, absolutely. And um, I'm, I am open for questions. Um, I don't know how we're doing on time. It looks like we're doing pretty well. So I have a few more minutes. If anybody needs to go, I understand that. And I really appreciate all of you listening in. I know uh, this format isn't ideal, but it is ideal if you want to be home and, and just on your computer and listening to me. But what's not ideal is that I can't see all of you all and um, ask you direct questions and make sure that you're understanding the uh, material. So um, please feel free to ask questions now or email me with questions or call my office or set up a, an introductory consult if you would like. And thank you so much for attending and, um, and joining us today. <laughs> oh, okay. Were you opening the floor to questions or... Yeah, I was. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, just checking. Yeah, so if anybody does have questions, now would be a great time. Um, I can even, if you want, um, I can unmute your line if you like. Um, you don't have to. You can also just enter something into the chat window and let me know. 
and if you prefer not to ask a question now, as she said, you can always just send an email or um, make a phone call. Okay, let's see. And if there aren't any questions, and I'll give you time to think about that, um, if there aren't any questions, I will go ahead and launch the final um, poll questions that we have for you. And that's just so that we know exactly what topics that you guys would be interested in hearing about in the future from Dr. Thompson. And if you don't see something here, you know, feel free to send an email. Um, the other thing is, uh, like Dr. Thompson was mentioning, just give us feedback. Do you like the webinar feedback? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the webinar format, or would you prefer a live meeting here at Whole Health Solutions in Fredericksburg? Any questions? Yeah, let's see. I think some people are still voting, but I don't see any questions. Okay. Yeah. So I'll leave the poll open for another um, minute or so. Oh. Let's see. All right. Okay. All right. I'll go ahead and end the poll. All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.